Welcome back, guys. Uh, this is uh, the Economic Liberty Lecture Series. I'm Bart Frazier, Program Director at the Future Freedom Foundation. Um, you know, we've been doing this for a little while here. Uh, this morning, I was looking back at some of our past lectures, and this is actually the sixth year that we've uh, been running this program in conjunction with the GMU Econ Society. And uh, George Selgin, who I've, I've wanted to have here for a very long time, is, is our 29th speaker. So it's a uh, uh, a lot of progress, a lot of great lectures, and, uh, and another great one tonight. Um, the, e the Economic Liberty Lecture Series, uh, the mission of it is to stress uh, the unbreakable link between economic liberty uh, and a free society. That's what we ask all of our speakers to stress when they come here, and uh, that's what you're going to see tonight. Uh, if you go back on our website, you can see all the previous lectures that we've had uh, before, um, all 29 there. Just hit the video section at the top of our website, and you can see them all, among other uh, things that we've done. Uh, the Future Freedom Foundation is a nonprofit libertarian educational foundation. Um, we uh, get the message of the free society out in a variety of ways uh, through the printed word. Uh, we publish a monthly journal called The Future of Freedom, uh, formerly known as Freedom Daily. There are free copies of it out on the table out back. Please uh, take a free sample. Uh, we also uh, have a very active website, as you might imagine, I just uh, referred to. Um, so check that out at fff.org. We also put out a daily newsletter called FFF Daily, which we consider to be the finest newsletter you can get on the internet. Uh, it is free for the asking. Uh, if you just send an email uh, to FFF at FFF.org with subscribe in the subject line, it'll start coming straight to your inbox free of charge. Um, uh, we have some new programs. Um, the main, the biggest of which is the Libertarian Angle. If you've seen it, it's a weekly program with our president, Jacob Hornberger, and our vice president and editor, Sheldon Richmond. Uh, every Monday, uh, they have a half hour long conversation covering the topics of day from a libertarian point of view. And we're taking that on the road this fall. We're hitting the southeast, uh, five universities, five days in a row. And, uh, and you can see the details of that uh, on our website as well. Uh, anybody new to the university uh, in this room tonight, I highly encourage you to please join the GMU Econ Society. It's a very, very active club, very devoted to economics and a free society. Uh, David uh, is the new president of the Econ Society tonight. He can tell you all about it, of course. Talk to him afterwards if you'd like to sign up. And uh, with that, David Roth. Good evening, everyone. My name is David Roth, and I'm the president of the GMU Econ Society. The Econ Society is a student organization committed to the personal, professional, and academic development of all students interested in the study of economics. We organize lecture series, discussion sessions, and other interactions between professional economists and students. If you'd like to learn more about the Econ Society, please speak to me or another officer after the event. It is my pleasure to introduce George Selgin. Uh, Dr. Selgin holds a BA in Economics and Zoology from uh, Drew University and a PhD in Economics from New York University. He is currently a professor of economics at the University of Georgia's Terry College of Business. He is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. His research covers a broad range of topics within the field of monetary economics, including monetary history, macroeconomic theory, and the history of monetary thought. He is the author of The Theory of Free Banking, Bank Deregulation, and Monetary Order, Less Than Zero, The Case for a Falling Price Level in a Growing Economy, and most recently, Good Money, uh, Bringingham Button Makers, and The Royal Mint, and the Beginnings of the Modern Coinage. Please welcome George Salterkin. Thank you, David and uh, Bart and uh, the the Future of Freedom Foundation and all of you for coming uh, to hear me speak on uh, free banking and uh, the importance of it and the free banking theory, which is really one I want to talk about, uh, to a free society. So my lecture isn't about free banking as much as about the importance of studying free banking for a free society. Uh, by the way, hearing that I'm the 29th speaker in this series gives me a little pause when the monetary economist hears the number 29. Of course, he worries about what's coming. So I hope this talk won't end with a great crash. 
Uh, uh, I want to start my talk, uh, which is ultimately about the connection between free banking, research, and a free society, by first talking about the place of this research in positive economics, that is, in, in economics as understood as, as simply a science of trying to understand the world. Because most of the work I do, I conceive of as being a contribution not to policy or to changing the world or to helping freedom along, though all of these things are things I value. I see it first and foremost as work contributing to positive economics, but I think it's important work. So I wanted to start with that. And, uh, uh, I also wanted to start with it because I'm often described as an advocate of free banking and sometimes I bristle just a little bit being an academic at that description. I think of myself as a student of free banking. Uh, but I think the subject that I study is very important in the general discipline of economics. And the reason I do is because I think that if you don't study free banking, and unfortunately, the vast majority of economists, including monetary and banking economists, really haven't paid any attention to it, much as I've been trying to get their attention, and Larry White has, and Kevin Dowd has, and several others have. Uh, I believe that without studying the workings of a free banking system as, as we've been trying to do, it's impossible to understand exactly what it is that governments do to their money in banking systems when they do intervene. Uh, in this regard, in this sense, I think that the theory of free banking is important to general monetary and banking theory in the same way that the theory of free trade is important to the general theory of trade. We don't live in a world of free trade. And not everyone who understands the theory of free trade is an advocate of free trade. But what every fr trade economist, that is, economist who's an expert or considered an expert in the field of trade, worth his salt, is expected to know, among other things, is the theory of free trade. It's the foundation theory, without which it's nonsense to claim that you understand anything about what tariffs really do, what protectionism really does or doesn't do. You may have wrong views about those things even if you are familiar with the free trade uh, theorems, but no one would take your views seriously unless you showed familiarity with the implications of free trade. And it doesn't matter, it wouldn't matter, if we lived in a world where free trade were entirely hypothetical. We still couldn't understand the actual way trade works without some kind of theory of free trade as a basis. I think everybody understands that. Well, I think it's equally true to say that persons, economists, who talk about central banks doing this or doing that or monetary and banking regulations having this or that effect on the economy, don't really know what they're talking about if they haven't studied free banking. Because what's their counterfactual? What are they comparing the effects of intervention to in concluding that the effects are this, that, or the other thing? You have to implicitly assume that something else happens in the absence of the interventions in question. You have to assume, if you say a central bank accomplishes this result, you have to assume something about what happens if there is no central bank. But unless you've studied systems without a central bank, in theory or by looking at history, how can you know? And the answer is, you can't. You're guessing. You're pretending to know, but you don't. That's a rather harsh thing to say about a lot of economists, but I'm saying it anyway because I think it's true. I'm not saying that because I've studied free banking, because I'm a student of that subject, that I've gotten everything right, but I think I have a chance of getting things right that can't be gotten right otherwise. So this is my view, the positive economics of free banking. Um, 
Let me give you just a couple examples, because all of this ties into what I want to say about why research on free banking is also something that anyone who likes, want, who believes in a free society and wants to see progress towards such a society or, uh, achieved, or at least would like to see the encroachments of the state upon freedom reduced, is something all those people should care a, a great deal about. And so I'm going to go from this discussion of the importance of positive, the, of, to positive economics of free banking research to the big question that really concerns us tonight. Uh, so the examples that will help me to make that transition uh, are first, a proper understanding of the influence of central banks upon economic stability. Most monetary economists simply assume that central banks stabilize their economies. That is, if you don't have a central bank, you'll have an unstable economy, but with a central bank, you might at least have a stable one. That's the standard operating assumption. Now, um, I wouldn't mind this standard view if, first of all, it was consistent with evidence. It's not. In the United States, for example, the U.S. economy has not been more stable by most measures since the establishment of the Fed even than it was before, and it certainly didn't have an ideal system before 1914. That's a different subject. But the other reason I, the other thing I, uh, that makes me mind this standard view that central banks hold central banks to be stabilizing is, again, that it comes from people who haven't studied the counterfactual case. That is, they've never even thought about what a, less, what a system without a central bank looks like, how it would work, and what its implications for economic stability really are. In fact, I've argued uh, in a number of places but in one article in the Independent Review, actually, I saw somebody with an issue of that. This was a, a couple years ago. Uh, if you really take the theory of free banking seriously, it's not difficult to show that central banks actually have a very important destabilizing influence in a free banking system. They make crises not less likely, but more likely than they would be in a system with competing banks of issue, a number of banks that all can issue currency, uh, and uh, especially one where there is uh, a base money like gold that is itself in limited supply that doesn't fluctuate wildly. Um, I'm tempted to do a little bit of theory here, but uh, let me try, before I do, let me try it in words. In a, in, a, in a competitive system, and by the way, I should have introduced this a little bit, a free banking system isn't, fortunately, something entirely hypothetical. There's, it's actually existed. So we can talk about what it involves, right? Uh, instead of a single bank that supplies currency, you have competing commercial banks, like those that today supply deposits, but that also supply a nation's circulating paper money. They, uh, in a truly free banking system, these banks are not heavily regulated and they're not bailed out or otherwise implicitly insured by the government, right? That's also a kind of legal restriction. The most famous example of such a system was the Scottish system, which flourished roughly from Adam Smith's day until the mid-19th century when, when English regulations were extended to Scotland that chipped away at the freedom of Scottish banks. All right. In such a system, no bank has uh, special privileges, particularly any unique privilege to supply paper currency. Now, we have to remember that under a gold standard, paper currency can be very popular even though it's convertible into gold and people can have gold. Paper can be considered much more practical, and so it was in Scotland. People preferred Scottish banknotes to gold whenever they had a choice. But that didn't mean that the Scottish banks could issue any amount of notes or otherwise expand the money stock aggressively and get away with it. 
Because they were all competing with each other, any bank that was too generous in lending would lose reserves to rival banks when those rival banks sent that bank's notes back for redemption, which they would do on a regular basis, just as banks exchange checks today. So no bank in the Scottish system was in a position to expand willy-nilly or arbitrarily to make credit really cheap and to, expand and to grow uh, without facing the actually rather rapid consequence of running out of reserves to rival institutions. So the banks were in a disciplined system where the discipline was not unlike that of a chain gang in, uh, in, a, in a modern prison, where the prisoners don't have to be chained down to any one thing. If they're chained to each other, they can't get away. None of them can run off and thereby make all the other prisoners run off at the same time. The one prisoner who tries to escape will just fall. Okay. If you introduce a monopoly, give one bank a monopoly of currency, then everything changes. That bank will, by having this monopoly, find that the other banks treat its no notes as a substitute for gold in their reserves. What does that imply? Well, it means that the privileged bank, when it expands, becomes isn't like a member of a chain gang with all the other rival banks. It's more like a Pied Piper of credit. When it expands, the other banks, treating its notes as reserves, act as if they have more gold. Actually, they have something better than gold that they covet and use that as a basis for their own expansion. So the whole system can start to run away from equilibrium. Prices will start rising. Uh, in a manner that's unlikely to happen in the competitive case for a given stock of gold reserves. The problem is that in that context, in a, sorry, in an international gold st standard context, uh, although a national system can, with a central bank can overexpand, that takes the country out of international equilibrium and there'll be a loss of reserves that eventually snap that country back into international equilibrium because otherwise it'll be, have its all, res, all the reserves of the country drained to the rest of the world. Anyway, what I've just described to you is a typical pattern of a 19th century gold standard boom-bust cycle. These cycles were much more serious with central banks than without. And they would, that meant that crises, financial crises, actually became more serious with central banks than without. That you could have financial crises also without a central bank. The U.S. had them, but it was, those were linked to other kinds of regulation. But central banking, per se, is a destabilizing factor. The other example that I wanted to provide of what free banking theory allows you to understand better has to do with the fiscal implications of government intervention in money, particularly the fiscal implications of having a central bank. And here I think the, the implications are more intuitively straightforward, but knowing what a free banking system does still helps to make those implications more readily discernible and understandable. The implications of having a central bank fiscally are that the government is able to borrow more and that it's more likely to be able to resort to inflationary finance. Now, that sounds trite, but let me explain. Let's again go back to our system of competing banks that are all obligated to redeem their currency in gold. There's no bank with a monopoly privilege. Let's suppose that the government approached one of these banks and said, would you please lend us a lot of money? First of all, that bank would have to respond by saying, well, we can only lend so much to you or to anyone else, because if we overlend, we'll lose reserves and we'll eventually fail because our rivals will return our items to us, our checks and notes that you spend, and we'll have to cash them. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. So. But what if the government said, well, don't worry. We'll give you permission to stop payment of your notes. You can issue irredeemable paper money. Sounds good, right? But, but the problem is, it's still not that much of an enticement to any of these competing banks of issue. Why not? 
because they have to worry about reputation in a competitive system. If one bank were to say to the government, okay, we'll take that, we'll take your redeemable currency, well, it might, it might seem good for a while, but it wouldn't be long before the public reacted by never dealing with that bank again and never holding its currency and taking its business to the other banks. So a reputation effect, apart from uh, uh, other considerations, a reputation effect alone makes it unlikely that any bank will want to issue inconvertible currency, even though the government allows it to do so with impunity, that is, without being, uh, without failing and having the repercussions of, of bankruptcy fall upon it, as long as it has to worry about rival banks. So, in contrast, and this is, by the way, all consistent with historical experience, if you first give one bank a monopoly of currency, then say to that bank, we want to borrow heavily from you, more heavily than you can pay while staying on the gold standard, that bank might then say, well, I'm sorry, we can't go along, but if you let us suspend payments and get away with it, we'll do it. Because at that point, there's no rival banks issuing currency, and that bank's currency, therefore, continues to be held and used. This is what happened during the Napoleonic Wars. When the Bank of England suspended payments, people didn't go elsewhere, but that's because it had such monopoly privileges as made its currency uniquely uh, uh, um, uh, acceptable in the English economy. Had a Scottish bank been given the right to, to uh, suspend independently of its rivals, of course it couldn't have gotten away with it. All right, so we've seen two results here, and the, these results are the things I wanted to emphasize before I talk about what all this means for a free society, but I think you can see where we're going with this. And the results are that if you understand what the difference is in theory, backed by historical experience, between uh, a free banking system and a central banking system, both for the likelihood of crises and also for the potential for government to be able to engage in inflationary finance, you see that central banks make crises more likely, particularly in a gold standard setting, but not just, and they also make resort to inflationary finance more likely. Once you know those things from the theory, we, that will, uh, I think, help you to understand why as advocates of a free society, as people who are interested in maintaining general freedom as well as economic freedom, free banking is something that you should see as very important, something that you should want more people to be aware of and you should want more people to study. So let me t turn to the question then. Why is free banking important for a free society? The, the simple answer to this question, but the one that I'm not going to settle on, is that bankers are people too, and they deserve to be free like everybody else. And that's fine. It's kind of a natural rights perspective. Uh, it's certainly consistent with that. Uh, and we could stop right there and make a case for freedom in banking if we wanted to. I'm a consequentialist, though. Economists usually are. And so uh, that's a kind of utilitarianism. I think that we can make a further case that banking should be free by appealing to the consequences that we've just pointed to that come from an understanding of the theory. And those consequences might be boiled down into a very simple statement, which is this. Central banking is the health of the state. Central banking is really a key factor that allows governments to grow and encroach on all kinds of freedom. And so it isn't just that by not having a free banking system, you have less freedom because you don't have freedom in banking. By not having a free banking system, you end up with less freedom in all kinds of ways because you end up with a lot more government regulation of all kinds of economic activity. How many of you are familiar with Bob Higgs's work on the ratchet effect? 
All right. Well, you can easily see then how free banking matters in light of that theory. Now, Bob Higgs doesn't write about free banking at all, but it turns out that it's very easy to show why free banking makes uh, the ratchet more likely to kick in based on both of those basic conclusions that I drew before. So here, finally, I get to use the blackboard. Right. So the ratchet effect is this idea that um, we may have some background growth in the size of government. And this, uh, Higgs emphasizes that by the size of government, we shouldn't think of necessarily dollars of spending here, right? It's more about the amount of power and regulation that governments impose on people. That's what we mean by size. Measure it any way you like. You know what I'm talking about. All right. When you have a crisis, there's a tendency for government to grow in response to that crisis. But Higgs's point is that even after the crisis is resolved, after it passes, government doesn't bounce back to the old level. It bounces back somewhat, but the trend line becomes permanently higher. And so every crisis brings us growth in government, growth in capital G government in the sense of government control of our lives. Well, what kind of crises do that? The most common crises that do that are financial crises and wars. So if you want to hold back the growth of big G government, you have to avoid those episodes that allow the size of government to ratchet up and not come back down fully. Because every time you have such an episode, then, of course, uh, you have a bigger government that's a residue of that and that much more work cut out for you if you want to re recover the degree of, e of freedom you had before. So given that this is true, if Higgs's argument is true, and Higgs himself provides a lot of evidence for it, I think the intuition is clear, and I think you are all familiar with this tendency. We can see it happening now in the aftermath of the Great Recession. Government, the recession, we hope, will eventually be really, really over, but who believes in this room that they won't leave us with a permanently enlarged state? That's just one of many examples we could point to. So the, the one thing that would be most desirable and helpful in avoiding the growth of government and the consequent reduction in freedom would be an, uh, arrangements that make crises m less likely. But if the crises that are most important or most typically responsible for the ratchet effect are financial crises and wars, well, I think you can now draw the connection to the theoretical results that I pointed out before, because central banking systems make financial crises more likely, boom-bust cycles particularly, and because they make it easier for governments to finance wars, including very unpopular wars, uh, and thus to grow in connection with these unpopular wars, because once the war starts, then of course the likelihood is that government encroachments of other kinds will take place. It's not just a question of increased military spending. In history, by the way, I'm doing some research on this right now, looking at re the, the resort to paper money finance in past wars in a number of countries. It's by the way, one fact that emerges very clearly is that the private financial sector doesn't like war, actually. There's a very good new book on this. And, uh, and free bankers wouldn't particularly like war. Uh, that is, they don't like wars unless there's something in it for them, but usually there's not. There would be, by the way, if the war were truly a defensive war. I think most bankers could figure out that if they're about to be invaded, it might be worth their putting out some money for the sake of fending off an invasion. But if the war is a foreign intervention that doesn't have any real defense implications, well, that's just bad business for the financial community for all kinds of reasons. In any event, though, as we've seen, there are simple market incentives that would make it difficult for free banks to 
cooperate with the government paper money finance scheme because any single bank that did it would get in trouble. A monopoly bank even may not be all that keen on cooperating. The Bank of England didn't want to suspend payments in 1797, but, but it could and it could get away with it and it did and so the government essentially forced it to do so uh, rather than stop borrowing from it. The bank had been pleading with the government to pay back its loans and uh, so forced it into a suspension that the government then allowed it to continue with for about uh, 23, 24 years. So we would have fewer wars and certainly fewer unpopular wars and we would have fewer crises so we'd have fewer ratchets, so we'd have less government of all kinds interfering with our lives. And I personally can't think of any other single economic change, any other kind of deregulation that would have such wide-ranging consequences for the progress of freedom or for the preservation of freedom. I don't think you're going to get it by deregulating the auto industry, by getting the government out even of health care. I think we can think of industries and aspects of our lives where government intrusion directly impinges on our freedom, our sense of freedom, much more than regulation of banks and currency appears to. Yet, I think I'm right in saying that there's no sector of the economy where deregulation and getting government out would have such important long-run consequences for our, our ability to hold back growth of government and to protect our freedoms and to reduce encroachments upon them. That at least is my belief. So uh, let me come back to where I started by saying I think free banking theory is very important for understanding economics generally, for positive economics. I think if we don't care at all about whether people are free or not, we can understand our monetary systems better just by knowing about this alternative. But since we do care about freedom, then knowing about it, I think, is even more, much more important because it is really what the theory tells us is that when governments intervene in money, especially by monopolizing it, they provide themselves with an instrument or tool, a, a, if you like, a sort of wedge by which they then can generate more of the very crises that allow them to grow more and more and more over time. So dealing uh, with thinking about getting government out of money is thinking about taking a, depriving it of a powerful weapon or tool that it has used again and again, sometimes inadvertently, to promote itself, to make itself bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's, for me, why this is an extremely important subject for all uh, libertarians, classical liberals, all, all people who favor a free society to uh, 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 want to understand and promote. I think I'm going to just stop there and let us talk about all kinds of things, because that's basically what I have to say on this. Is that too short? But I'm happy to talk in, about, answer your specific questions, which is always a lot of fun anyway. So uh, I'll start. <laughs> Oh, okay. Oh, for the questions, you mean? Exactly. Yes. Thank you. I walked in a little bit late, and I'm not sure if you talked about how the competitive landscape of free banking would look like. I was wondering if you could share a little bit of, would there be competitive money printing? Uh, how would 
would, uh, would there be exchange rates between the money of different banks and so on? So, uh, yes, I'm happy to talk about that. And I, I probably, even when I did talk about it, I didn't talk about it enough. Uh, my understanding of free banking sees the bankers as playing a very modest role that is not much different fundamentally from the role that we see banks playing today. And so, first of all, uh, free bankers aren't creating basic monies. Free bankers are in the business, like most real bankers, of accepting the money that's, that is the standard money already in the economy, not of coming up with new standards. They try to get you to bring that stuff to them so that they can loan it at interest and share the interest with you and, and uh, at the same time uh, attract your money by offering convenient substitutes that can also be used in exchange. So let's talk about history. In the freest banking systems of the past, bankers simply accepted the fact that the basic monies of their economies consisted of gold or silver coins, or sometimes both. They received these coins uh, on deposit uh, or in exchange for their notes. They were very clever about issuing notes that could be good substitutes for coins uh, so that people would be tempted to take them. They were not fractional reserve institutions for good reasons. The notes that they issued were acknowledged as IOUs or debt instruments. There is a long history here, but the bottom line is just as today you had a choice, uh, you have a choice, you can put money in a safety deposit box. In those days, and going back actually much further uh, uh, before the advent of free banking in Scotland and, and elsewhere, there was a general rule in place in most parts of the world, certainly in the Anglo-Saxon countries, uh, that actually dated back to ancient times, where if you wanted your banker to store coins for you, you put them in a sealed container or gave explicit instructions to that effect. And then you were dealing with a, not a true bank, but a warehouse type bank. And the banker would give you a bailment receipt. It would say, we're storing something and such on, uh, uh, for you. It would be very explicit. But if you brought loose coins and didn't indicate otherwise, the coins became the banker's property to lend or otherwise employ as the banker wished, and you would get, in return, a promise to pay, a debt instrument, which is the appropriate instrument when you no longer own the property, property you've deposited, but you have the right to get it back, perhaps on demand, perhaps after a delay. All free banks were such lending institutions with fractional reserves, nothing wrong with it, perfectly voluntary, and in the cases where uh, they flourished, uh, the consequences were very sound. So to get back to your question, these, in, these banks, these free banks as I perceive them, aren't creating unique monies. They're creating IOUs to standard money already in existence. So their notes don't have fluctuating exchange rates. They're all, if the banks are good, uh, par instruments uh, worth the same amount of money as they are claims to and therefore uniform in terms of the basic standards. So the Scottish banks are issuing notes denominated in pound sterling units, and a five pound note from the Bank of Scotland is worth the same amount as a five pound note from the Royal Bank of Scotland, and both of them are worth a definite amount of gold. So that's the kind of system we have in mind. One can contemplate a free banking system that's based on a current fiat money standard, of course, then, free banking alone doesn't solve all your problems. You have to better regulate the basic money still, so free banking isn't a solution in itself, though it can help. Uh, we would still have to do something about making sure that the base money isn't over-issued. So that's anyway, that's a description. Hayek confused things a lot. Hayek wrote a wonderful pamphlet that had a big effect on me back in the 70s. He wrote it uh, where he describes his idea of choice in currency, but there he has private institutions issuing their own irredeemable paper monies and circulating at varying exchange rates with each other. Basically, a bunch of little central banks competing. Now, the point of high excess was that these competing central banks would probably behave a lot better than the monopoly ones we actu actually have, and I think he's right. 
Nevertheless, I also think his scheme is entirely uh, fantastical. I don't think that any, uh, that any private institution could ever fob off its irredeemable paper on anyone. But Bitcoin gives me some pause because Bitcoin uh, has achieved a foothold and Bitcoins have no non-monetary value. Uh, uh, unless it's a kind of psychological value. It is a bit of a mystery how they took off. I think I know the answer to it, but in any event, uh, Hayek's scheme is still largely hypothetical, and it's not what I have in mind with free banking. Does that, does that give you a complete enough picture? Yeah. Question, yes. <clears throat> well, yeah, so I um, mean the free banking uh, situation, you'd have a, uh, you, well, let's say you didn't have free banking, you had a central bank, a central bank which monopolized its ability to, to give, go, to issue, to have, it had some supply of gold and it issued uh, um, things that were exchangeable for gold ultimately. Uh, wouldn't, I mean, assuming it would not be fractional, it would be, the requirement would be that it, it would be, it, it could only uh, issue, uh, a paper or whatever, in, insofar as it could, there was a real amount of gold behind it. Um, that's not true of what actual central banks have done. Are you proposing? Well, oh, some I understand that. I'm saying I'm You're talking proposing about this as something in the case to you consider. put forward. In the first, wing, if, if they were to do that, what would happen? Um, right. Of course, that's not what's being done. That's okay, so um, obviously the the problem with actual uh, central banks today, which are issuing fiat money, is that there's really no material. There's no material limits at all to what they can create, and so we have to worry about them not behaving well. And we have to, uh, on the other hand, trust that they will behave well, not because of any profit motive that forces them to do so, but simply out of the goodness of their hearts and all that. Right. Now, if you, in a free banking system, let's go back to a gold-based free banking system, right? Um, uh, if you... In the, the virtue of this system is, we can let's let's speak of dollars. Let's suppose there's a given amount of gold reserves in the system, right? And with free banking, what you have is the demand for reserves looks like this. If this is this is total transactions, which is banknotes and how often they're spent, velocity. So, with if no one spends banknotes. They could issue an infinite amount, practically, because the demand for reserves would be zero. Right? If there's no velocity, uh, notes aren't getting to other banks that return them for redemption. So we have a corner uh, here for demand. But we know that as payments increase, the flow of stuff through the clearinghouse increases, and net settlements, which concern the the fluctuations in the net amounts, even if all the other banks, you know, on average, banks can't be losing or gaining reserves, right, in equilibrium, but they need some reserves because of the random fluctuations in net clearings. Does that make sense to everybody? So we know this line's going to go up as payments go up. And voila, very simple, we're simplifying a lot, but you have a, an equilibrium value of total spending that's automatic for a given stock of reserves, which is nice because it's like NGDP targeting, but it's automatic. It's a result of competition. And by the way, it doesn't matter what this, if the public wants to switch from deposits to currency since the banks are supplying independently their own notes, it doesn't matter what, what mix of those two is involved. The, the banks can accommodate that perfectly. They don't need more reserves. So it's very nice, very nice result from a macroeconomics point of view. All right, if you give a central bank uh, a monopoly of currency, then on the one hand, it looks like if, if, you, if you don't back the central bank notes 100%, right, what ends up happening is that all this gold, first of all, goes to the central bank, which treats it as reserves, and the banks hold the central bank's IOUs and treat that as their reserve, right? Now, if there's not a... 100% reserve requirement on the central bank, I'm getting to your question, right? then that's trouble because then when the central bank resorts to fractional reserves, it, shift, it can shift this thing out. Of course, then if it goes back on its reserve, but the central bank's reserve ratio is going to effectively determine total reserves and that's going to mean that spending and prices, et cetera, can go up and that you get out of international equilibrium and bad things happen. All right, so now let's go back to your, your case which is much better. In a 100% reserve case, the, the central bank uh, 
uh, now is forced to not do anything except issue as a nominal quantity of its IOUs equal to the former gold and hold on to that gold. So no problem, except here's where the rub comes in. If it has a monopoly of currency, right, remember how we said that as long as the banks can issue their own notes, it, they're indifferent to whether the public wants more currency or not. They don't care what the mix of their IOUs is. Their reserve needs depend on the total outstanding IOUs. So a change in the currency ratio doesn't do anything. In the central banking system, remember, the banks are holding reserves. Uh, the only reserves that banks have are the notes of the central bank, and that's the only paper currency they can supply to their own customers. So now, what happens if people come to the system and want to withdraw more currency? Reserves decline. They deposit it back. They go up. So you get instability from the currency ratio changing, even under your plan, which makes it inferior. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. But it's an improvement on the alternative of letting the central bank... See, by letting the central bank change its reserve ratio, and this is the trouble, right? Mon your, your average central bank proponent will say, we need to have the central bank have the freedom to change its own reserve ratio to offset changes in the currency ratio. We can't not have it do that. But then, of course, when you give it that power, you give it the power to do which is what, in practice, what central banks do. So the good news is you get all the currency you need at Christmas time, right? We never run out, it's fine. But you get secular inflation. Uh, George, with respect to the, uh, the panics that were taking place before the Fed, mm -hmm. um, were the, well, can you tell, what those, tell us what those were all about, and are sure. those attributed to government intervention, or does that happen in a free market anyway? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm so glad you, you asked that. Um, so my argument earlier was that if you compare a free banking, a true free banking system to a central bank system, central banking is really destabilizing, and we've talked more about that now uh, thanks to the previous question. But that's not, I'm not asserting that any system without a central bank is therefore stable. And the U.S. pre-Fed system is a very good example, but it wasn't a true free banking system. So let me briefly summarize the regulations that were very important in the U.S. case before the Fed. So there were two that were particularly important, and I'm especially concerned with the post-Civil War period. After the Civil War, the only banks that issued currency were national banks. State banks were driven out of the business by a tax passed during the war. So uh, two facts about these banks. None of them could branch. Essentially, national banks were all unit banks. So they were very weak and prone to failure, partly because of a lack of diversification. In contrast, Scottish banks could branch nationwide. And so could Canadian banks, which are perhaps the second best example before 1935 and especially before 1914, uh, because World War I involved some serious government interference in the Canadian banking system. Before 1914, Canada also had a, an approximately free banking system with competitive banks, of course, no central bank, different brands of banknotes, but nationwide branch networks. So they have many fewer banks in the U.S. So Canada has 20, I mean, let's say, let's say at, a peak, at a peak, perhaps 40 banks of issue we have at a peak even after the Civil War. Well, our peak is 1929. It's about 30,000 banks, and then most of them are about this big. So that's one issue. The other is, under the rules of the national banking system, a bank can only issue currency if it backs that currency 100% with U.S. government bonds, and not only with U.S. government bonds, but with particular U.S. government bonds. That law was, in, that rule was included in the National Banking Acts because those acts were passed during the Civil War with the very purpose of generating more revenue for the government, in this case by forcing uh, currency issuing institutions to buy government bonds. Well, okay, let's not talk about whether this was a good idea for paying for the war, 
but let's talk about its long-run consequences, which were this. After the Civil War, as after every war in those days, the government retrenched in, in its spending and its debt. There was still a ratchet effect, but the government decided to, had issued tons of debt during the war, and it's paying it off afterwards. So there are fewer of these bonds. That means that the maximum amount of currency the banks can issue is also shrinking. And that's exactly what you see in the statistics. So the U.S. currency supply, there's $350 million of national banknotes in circulation uh, um, in around 1880. By 1890, that number is down to about 120 million. So we're talking about 40-something percent of the... And this is in a growing economy. Plus, there's no ability for banks to supply currency for temporary needs because then they'd have to buy these really hard-to-get expensive bonds. The bonds at one point are selling for a premium of 35 bucks and a $100 bond. They'd have to buy them. Right? You're paying a big premium... Then you're issuing notes for just a month or so that come back and earn you no interest the rest of the time, not worth it. So there would be no extra currency supplied during the harvest season in particular, which is when the peaks were back then. In Canada, in contrast, so if you look at national bank notes, they go like this. And then they're kind of stable. And then they introduce some new bonds. But they're never growing up. In Canada, you have this wonderful pattern. It's comp competition, right? where the currency supply not only is trending up during the same time, Canada is also growing, but it goes like this. Doot, doot. It looks like a heartbeat. Doot. But those peaks are the harvest season. If you looked at that and you were a typical central banker, you'd say, boy, this guy's doing a good job. Because you would assume it's a centrally planned money supply. It's doing just what you would think it would do if it was following demand. Except it's not. It's all competition doing a great job. Canada has no crises during this time. It has a minor one in 1907, but that's because there was a regulation that became binding then on total note issues of the Canadian banks linking it to their capital. They raised the limit, and the crisis went away. In the U.S., every fall, the money market gets tight. The story is more complicated because there's this pyramiding of reserves that's itself a consequence of the lack of branch banking, where one bank in the countryside is counting on a deposit in a bank in Chicago as part of its reserves, and that bank's counting on another deposit in New York as part of its reserves, which means there's one dollar of gold in New York, or the equivalent, and uh, uh, all right, there's no dollar gold coin, but let's say there's a dollar's worth of gold in New York that three banks are counting on having available for their reserves. That's okay in the off-season when money is going into New York, but in the harvest, it's all coming back. So everybody's scrambling for that dollar of gold. Every autumn, as I said, credit gets tight and interest rates spike. But in some periods, a full-blown financial crisis happens as the contraction of credit becomes severe. Panic sets in. People are worried that they won't be able to get cash, all that, uh, uh, and they run on it because they worry. And you have a self-fulfilling prophecy of, of currency shortages and, ca and, and credit stringency that is especially felt in New York, because that's where all the pressure is concentrated. So we have major financial panics, 1884, 1893, 1907, right? But these aren't the consequences of free... Oops! These aren't the consequences, sorry, gosh. These aren't the consequences of freedom in banking. These are the consequences of the regulatory apparatus, the weakness of the banks, first of all, compounded by the, uh, the uh, uh, inflexibility of the currency supply. And so it's in response to these panics that a currency reform movement gets going after 1907, and especially with the establishment of the nine, uh, National Monetary Commission in 1908, which reports in 1910, uh, you know how it's all going to end. What you may not know is that there were many attempts to introduce Canadian-style reforms in the U.S. after, 18, after uh, 1893. They all failed because of, uh, I'm sorry to say, uh, lobbying, uh, mainly because of lobbying by the banking industry where the established bankers opposed any reform that would have introduced branch banking, which all of these measures would have as a necessary part of a currency system that would be flexible but wouldn't allow excess issues, right? So uh, interestingly, uh, 
The Main Street bankers opposed branch banking and opposed all these asset currency reforms, that's what they called them, because they said Main, uh, uh, that Wall Street would invade their territory. But the other big opponents of the reforms were the Wall Street bankers. Can anybody guess why? Why would Wall Street bankers oppose nationwide branching? Couldn't that allow them, as the Main Streeters feared, to invade the Main Street banking systems and take over? It may be, but they had a good thing in the status quo. The good thing was that anyone who wanted access to the New York money market, any other financial institution, had to bank with them to put money there. So they had all this wonderful correspondent business. Why would they want to lose that? And they got it only because no other banks could directly do business in New York. So we got the Fed because these other ideas couldn't get through politically. Not because the Fed was the first best remedy at all. Canada proved that. And Canada would keep on proving it for another couple decades when, of course, our wonderful central bank arrangement laid a gigantic egg in the Depression. Canada suffered severely from the Depression, but that was... That suffering was not so much because, not because of its monetary system, which in our case, the U.S. collapse was centered on the collapse of the banking and monetary system. Canada had to suffer. We were their main export market. They were bound to suffer when we suffered, when we failed. But in Canada, the money supply didn't shrink 33%, adding to the misery, which it did here. It shrank 13%. And the reason there was, a, of course, there was some shrinkage because, again, without exports, you lose gold, of course, right? Um, but how many banks failed in Canada? There's a question. We lost about 6,000 in three years. How many Canadian banks? There were fewer Canadian banks, so even one failure would have been a much bigger percentage loss, admittedly. So how many Canadian banks failed? Yeah, so we can conclude that even in percentage terms, it was much better, right? There were no Canadian bank failures. Now, that's partly because it was easier to, 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 it was easier to uh, uh, deal with troubled insolvent banks by arranging a merger under that system, and that's what the Canadian authorities often did with the cooperation of the bankers, of course. But never mind, that's still part of the advantage of having a truly free system that you can do that. So... Uh, yeah, it's possible to have an unstable banking system without a central bank. It's unlikely to have an un, a, 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 a stable system with a central bank. And the one way you can have a stable system is by having no central bank but also no other stupid bank regulations. And, and, and the evidence is clear from those systems that look most like what I just described, Canada, Scotland, and some others as well that haven't gotten as much attention. And all of this, I mean, I could be lecturing, I'm glad to be lecturing you because you care, but I could be lecturing a room of prominent monetary economists, and I dare say in that room the number of things that I would have said this evening that were familiar already to those economists would be fewer than the number that you already knew. And that's what I mean by saying that from the point of view of positive economics, there's a lot to be gained by insisting that economists should be familiar with this uh, stuff, both in theory and in history. But to you who care primarily about freedom, it's also important that you understand how much free banking matters and how much we've lost because we haven't had it. Uh, the state could never have gotten as big as it was if it hadn't uh, stuck its grubby hands in the banking system as much as it has. I really do believe that. Uh, Professor Selgin, at the beginning of your lecture, you analogized free banking to, to free trade um, mm -hmm. and, and pointed out that international economists have to know about how free trade works uh, before they learn about tariffs. Uh, I, I wonder if I could belabor that analogy a little bit uh, because Hong Kong has practiced unilateral free trade um, whereas many other countries engage in uh, bilateral trade agreements uh, and so forth. And Hong Kong has been very successful with unilateral free trade. Uh, why haven't we seen um, unilateral free banking, a departure from central banking to free banking? It would seem to me that, uh, that the government would be sacrificing tariff revenue just as they would be sacrificing seniorage. Um, 
and based on what you've said about uh, how countries can be more successful without a central bank as far as less financial panics, et cetera, why haven't we seen unilateral, uh, a unilateral shift from central banks to, uh, to free banking in some countries? Well, uh, this gives me, your question, Chuck, gives me an opportunity to kind of synthesize uh, from the positive economics to the other, uh, to, the, to, the, to, to the practical question. Um, so part of the problem is, let's face it, with free trade, because economists have studied it, one of the consequences, and they've studied it whether they cared about freedom or not, right? Because they had to, they felt obliged to. But one of the consequences was that, has been, that you had a large number of economists who, having studied it, said, you know, this is good. And because that happened, they said, this is so good that it's irresponsible for governments to not do it. And you've had economists boosting free trade, not just studying it, but boosting it upon having studied it. And, uh, and thanks to this intellectual development, that comes from pure theory, we've had the intellectual support, not just uh, popular support, but intellectual support for actual free trade that has succeeded in overcoming the government's own, let's say, uh, narrower interests or those of special interest groups in a few cases, right, to a limited extent. It's hard for governments to oppose something consistently that, that there's a big consensus of economists in favor of that, that, that uh, against the, the, a large consensus of economists. So I do think it matters that economists are not uh, in large numbers studying this subject because it prevents more of them from saying, you know, this is a good si system, this can work. And as a result, governments face no opposition, concerted opposition by experts to their interventions in money. On the contrary, Economists, by and large, have egged governments along in their move to establish central banks, to establish fiat money, and so on. So part of the answer, Chuck, I'm not pretending this is a complete answer, because honestly, the complete answer depends on what exactly makes a place like Hong Kong embrace free trade. And I think that has something to do with the fact that a single country unilaterally embracing free trade can profit from it precisely because a lot of people want a place to trade freely in, right? A single country that em embraces free banking could, con could profit from having a, a, a very successful banking sector. We know that. And that might be enough reason for a small economy to do it. But uh, otherwise, I think, uh, as has happened with free trade, most countries, governments would think that uh, the long-run advantages fiscally uh, uh, to them of having a captive banking system, a centralized banking system, will swamp those of having an economy that is an attractive economy because of its banking arrangements. And without government, uh, without many experts telling them otherwise, they're just too inclined to take advantage of, of uh, the, the short, at least short-run gains from exploiting their monetary systems. And, and, and defense has a lot to do with this, right? Uh, governments want to be in a position, and this goes back to ancient times, they want to be in a position to preserve power, and they don't want financial ability, uh, resources to limit their ability to do that in a pinch. So access to the printing press or to the basement has always been very important. Without concerted opposition from expert economists, uh, uh, there's just no reason for g most governments to uh, res resist the temptation to intervene in their monetary systems. I think governments find it very hard to uh, to do things where a large consensus of expert opinion t says that it's a wrong thing to do. Uh, but but in, in the case of money and banking, the consensus just isn't in favor of freedom. And, uh, and that's because most economists have never even studied the subject. Oops. Make it a good one. I'll attempt to. Um, some of the proponents of central banking, or uh, that I have heard, um, 
they ascribe from the period the lack of vicissitudes um, in the financial system from 1940 to say 1970 as a result of increased regulation things like Glass-Steagall. Um, I wonder what you would ascribe these supposed last vicissitudes to in comparison to, er, to say, 1976 onward. Oh. I'm, support, I, I'm sorry, I couldn't quite make out your noun. Uh, what is... Um, you mean... Versus, you know, volatility. Volatility. Well, the greatest, the period of the greatest uh, volatility, of the, of the least volatility since the Fed, has been 84 to the outbreak of the recent crisis, the so-called great moderation. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, yeah, we had, we had somewhat greater volatility after the, civil, after the Second World War in general, but look at what we're comparing it to. So let me go over some of the basic statistics here. If you compare the volatility, first of all, First of all, there are a number of different economic statistics out there regarding the pre-Fed era, and not all of them are equally reliable. If you use uh, Romer statistics, Christina Romer's, which are revised from the old NBER statistics, and I think much better, you'll find the following, that from 1873 to 1914, we don't have statistics going back further than 1873, I think it's 1873, pardon me if I'm off by a year or two. The volatility of output, just measured by you know, the usual standard deviation, uh, for that period is lower by Romer's measures than the volatility from 1914 onwards. Now, if you leave out the period from 1914 to the Second World War, inclusive, right, and call it practice for the Fed, I like to call this the, the Fed's practice period, because that was the most, I mean, that was a disaster from the point of view of volatility. And just compare the post-45 to the pre-14. Using Romer statistics, there's basically no difference. So, turns out that the period, you have to pick a very relatively small sample sub-period, right, from 18, 1984 to nine, 2007, and then you will be able to say that, see, the Fed's made things better than before 1914 for that sub-period. But it didn't last, so what does it prove, right? And if you can pick your data that way, well, I, I, I dare say one can find a period of equal length in the pre-Fed data that don't look so bad either, right? Um, now, two other things should be said about this record. I've almost forgotten your question, but I think I'm answering it anyway. Is that right? You are correct. Okay. So, um, two other things should be said. Let's, let's just suppose, let's just suppose that volatility since World War II has been the same, measured by standard deviation of output, as volatility before 1914, which is approximately true using Romer's data. Well now, of course, it's not clear that the difference, or lack of difference in this case, can be attributed to having a Fed or not having a Fed. Or, or to put that more clearly, for all we know, the Fed's doing a bang-up job because other things have changed since 1914 that would with the same system we had back then, have made for much more unstable output. So the fact that output is just as stable as before means the Fed's doing a great job because these other factors have changed in a destabilizing way. That's a possible argument, right? Counterfactuals are dangerous because a lot of things are changing over time. Except, I've looked at the literature, you know, and, and you can think about this, what are some of the things that could change the volatility independent of the monetary regime? Well, there's two that seem to me most important of those that I've, I'm aware of. One of them is the size of government. The other one is the extent to which the economy is uh, exposed to not demand shocks, which monetary policy is supposed to prevent, but supply shocks like harvest failures and wars. Well, let's take that latter thing. So, have supply shocks gotten worse since 19... 45. 
as they would have to in order for the Fed to be doing a good job without it showing up in stability? No. Statistical studies show that whereas in the modern era, maybe 5 6% of the total observed fluctuations in output can be traced to supply shocks. Of course, it depends what, how you identify them. There are many tricky statistical uh, questions here. But uh, there have been several attempts. The, all of them point in the same direction. Supply shocks explain about 5 6 maybe tops 10% of the volatility. The rest is all demand. Whereas before 1914, it's about 98% supply shocks. So things should, the Fed, if, the, if we had the same system bef now, since World War II as we had before, and the only other thing that changed was supply shocks getting uh, the, the, the relative importance of supply versus demand shocks, we'd have seen a much greater decline in volatility. So the Fed prevented a decline as far as that factor is concerned. The other one's growth in government. Well now, okay, what does government do? What is it, why does it matter? Well, no matter how much you think big government is terrible, and I, I'm perfectly happy to agree with you, it's terrible in reducing growth. But volatility is different. The bigger the government sector gets, guess what happens to volatility of standard measurements of GNP? What do you think? Do you think they go up or down, other things equal as government gets bigger? It's automatic stabilizing. The simplest way to think of this is this. In the last recession, did government get small? It got big. So the bigger the government is, and remember, when we measure G, we're measuring total spending, essentially, right? The bigger government is, the, the less volatility there will be, other things being equal, because of automatic stabilizers. That is, there's just, there are certain government things that get bigger when everything else is going down, right? And then, of course, there are also intentional stabilizers. So there's intentional counter-cyclical policies of the Fed and, and the Treasury or whatever, right? So all these factors should be stabilizing as other things equal as the as size of more, there should be more stability as overall government goes, uh, gets bigger. Well, if you look at the growth of government, it turns out it's flat before 1914 and it's very tiny. Then right about the time the Fed's created, it starts going up and up and up and up. It's about six, seven times bigger total government share of GNP uh, uh, since after World War II than it was uh, in 1914. So why didn't we see a big improvement in overall stability? The, the, possibly because the Fed has been doing such a lousy job. We, sh we didn't see any improvement. So if you, if you can think of any other factors that I might have gone the other way, I'd love to hear about them, but I haven't. So all this stuff that you hear, I'm going to give a Cato talk about this. And I have a paper now about it. The paper called uh, Has the Fed Been a Failure with Larry White and uh, Bill Estraps. That's in the journal Macro. It has all these statistics and everything. But bottom line is anyone who tells you that the Fed has helped stabilize the economy, I'd like to see how they prove that. I really would because all the statistics I've seen say otherwise. It's one of these big lies. And that's comparing it to that crummy pre-Fed system. That was no good, everybody. I'm not endorsing that. We haven't even done that well with the Fed. And remember, the Fed was set up so that we would do better than that terrible system. What it has done, as I've argued, is it's, the Fed has been a, va a great success in helping to encourage the very growth of government we were just talking about by generating crises and by helping to uh, finance unpopular wars and other programs too. The Fed helped finance the great society with inflation. And that, of course, is, has ratcheted permanently into our framework of government, hasn't it? George, yeah. I the last question. Sure. Uh, Professor Selge, I'm curious about what your thoughts on the future of free banking are. You talked a little bit about how in the past uh, free banking was adopted. It, it just adopted the existing uh, monetary base regimes. Uh, but given that we have completely different monetary systems than in the past, usually those were commodity standards in the past, uh, going forward, what, which do you see as maybe a most likely uh, possibility given that we have you know, technology? Do you see 
is more likely a, a purely digital uh, money, similar to uh, Bitcoin, even though Bitcoin doesn't have banking? Or do you see uh, a new kind of competing commodity-based system or, or something else? Yeah. So here's my view of bankers again, and I'll, I'll be a little bit more sp specific in, in answering your question. I think bankers are not big monetary innovators, uh, except when it comes to the IOUs that they, clever com substitutes they come up with that are IOUs of one form or another, or ways of transferring uh, 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 obligations. They're very good at that. But, but bankers basically do this. Here's by how I see it. They look around and they say, what's the base, what's the money people are already using? All right. I'm going to go into business accepting that stuff because that's the money. And so right now, for example, in principle, if let's say the law is not a factor, in principle, let's say you could set up a Bitcoin bank. Some people will do it if it's allowed eventually. And they will take Bitcoin deposits. They won't be physical, but they'll be digital. Most of our deposits are that way for dollars anyway, right? And they'll, they'll engage in fractional reserve lending, and they'll give out promises. It'll be a tough to sell because the promises have to be somehow perceived as being at least as convenient as a Bitcoin or more so. I don't know how you're going to do that, but let's just suppose you could. But that's still not going to be a tr an attractive business because the market's small. Where's the market big? Dollars. Dollars. That's where it's at. You're going to set up a bank. Most bankers are going to want to deal in dollars. And that, they're going to want to deal in dollars if they're really free. It's going to make it all that more attractive to deal in dollars. So bankers aren't in the business of encouraging new base monies um, because uh, that might be a nice thing for them to do, a public-spirited thing. They may even think that this other base money is, you know, a better. Bitcoin's better than dollars. But you're running a business, and you have to ask what's the size of the market. And the size of the dollar market's huge, right? Of course, at the margin, there, there's also more competition. So being the first Bitcoin banker may actually be a good choice. But there's not going to be that much interest in it as long as it's such a tiny part of all exchange activity. So, so free bank, the, a free banking system will follow the money in the sense of accepting the st dealing in the standard money that's there except that a free banking system could include a small component of banks proportional to the size of another parallel currency that's available dealing in that currency, but it won't be any more important than, than that. Thanks, everybody.